Bienvenue, c'est la session de Jim Hendler que je présente maintenant. C'est le Tetherless Profe World Professor of Computer Science, Web and Cognitive Science. Je vais traduire le professeur sans fil. Qu'est-ce qui est sans fil, le professeur ou, le, ou, le, ou la science Mais Le professeur sans fil euh, du monde euh, pour l'ordinateur, le web et les sciences cognitives. Euh, il... Il a un tas de prix, je n'en parle pas. Lui, il déteste les longues introductions, et moi aussi. Euh, mais il, je rencontre une anecdote. Il a été nommé comme un des, en 2012 comme un des, des enseignants les plus novateurs aux États-Unis par le journal Playboy. Merci. Bonjour. And now you have heard one of the two words I know in French, so I will have to transfer back to English. Um, I'm going to give a different talk, actually, than the one I had originally planned, because rather than a technical talk, it felt that, uh, and talking to the organizers last night, that this morning it would be better to sort of be framing some of the issues we will be discussing over the next few days. So um, while I couldn't understand what Stephen said, I could see his slides were about overlapping topics with some of what I'm going to talk about. But since I have no idea whether I'm agreeing or disagreeing with him, you'll have to figure that out. And then tonight on the debate, we'll disagree whatever happens. That <laughs> makes it more exciting. Um, but in a sense, there's been a lot of change in artificial intelligence over the past few years, and that's why everyone's so excited about it and things. What I want to do is show a little bit about what's happening in AI, what are some of the issues that are solved by some of the newer technologies, what are some of the problems that still remain, and where do some of the issues of traditional, what um, uh, Stephen called good old-fashioned AI, and sort of modern AI, how they interact. And just to sort of say in advance where I'm trying to get to, my belief is that we must explore how these two come together, that neither one replaces the other right now, that we have to truly understand both. And that's what I'm going to try to convince you of today. No. That'll work. Um, my publisher made me promise to show this in every talk I give because nobody's buying the book, but uh, <laughs> we have a book and many of the concepts that I'm going to uh, discuss today do come from or addressed, although many have evolved since the book was published. But really the key thing that we're seeing in today's AI and what's causing so much attention is that three different technologies have sort of all evolved sort of through the knee in an exponential curve. So if you look at exponential growth, when you're in it, you can't really tell what's happening. But at some point, it suddenly seems like things take off. And so the, 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 the informal term for that is the knee in the, in the exponential curve. And what we've really seen is three different kinds of technologies going through that curve. So the first one, and the one most people have heard about, is deep learning, uh, the, the modern version of neural networks that really have just done a significant amount of being able to be trained and learned in ways that just um, even a couple years ago we would have been surprised by. In fact, when I was writing the book I mentioned, uh, we, sent the, we finally got the first draft done in November of, I think it was 2015, 16. Um, and we had a chapter on game playing just to show sort of what the differences were between how computers do things and humans do things. And we compared chess as the game that computer was best at and Go as the game that, that humans could do that you know, computers were not going to be close anytime soon. Right? By the time uh, we went out for review in January, uh, AlphaGo had beaten the 785th best player. Now, in chess, 
the time from about that same level of performance until the AI beat the world's expert was about five or six years. So we said, OK, we have a few years. So we said, we, we kind of rewrote the chapter to say, computers are starting to get to where they can play some go. By the time we got the galleys, the computer had beat the fourth best player in the world. And you know everyone knew about it. So we, of course, had to rewrite our chapter at the last second. So that's how fast this stuff came to attention. But that's a, about a six-month period there. We went from thinking Go was 10 to 20 years from being solved to uh, it not only was it solved, but what a lot of people don't realize is that AlphaGo, which was built by DeepMind working with Google, Facebook had an almost as good Go player that they were getting ready to start challenging top players using a slightly different technique, but a similar deep learning. So, so that really pushed this into public attention. But it was really more the vision processing work, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But then the second thing that was happening in um, 2011, <coughs> the computer Watson beat the world's best players at the uh, televised game Jeopardy. Jeopardy is kind of a broad knowledge game, right? Um, the, the game has a kind of twist to it, which is they give you an answer and you have to generate a question. But it's really similar to that. But the questions can be very, um, uh, very context dependent. There can be very subtle clues in them. Um, I used to use the example that if I said, in 1997, he was the Prime Minister of Canada, and I say, in 1997, she was the Prime Minister, you actually get two different answers because that particular year there were two different Prime Ministers, one who was male, one who was female. So, we, so the computer had to pick up on a lot of those kind of things, had to answer questions from a very broad range of categories, et cetera. Um, so the, the technique used is, doesn't have a single name, but we typically are calling it associative learning. And then the other thing that's really changed a lot is at the back end of a lot of this is what's now called knowledge graphs. Um, and it has changed how search works. And of course on the web, anything that search does generates a lot of, um, a lot of effect out into the world. So it changes e-commerce, it changes how business works. Many of the things that you now see, uh, if you have an Alexa or a Google Home or use Siri, those, those things are doing speech recognition, but the actual processing of the speech, the actual understanding of what answer to give is happening based on this technology. So these three technologies, I'm gonna go just a couple slides each through them. So deep learning, Really what was the big thing in deep learning, I could give a long technical explanation about kind of why there was an assumption that these big deep networks really wouldn't be able to do things. And some people sort of realized that the, the technical problem could be solved if the networks were built a little differently, if they weren't completely connected and completely symmetric. And so some new types of techniques called uh, convolutional techniques and uh, recursive techniques started to get added to the neural nets. And that very significantly boosted their power. But to do that, you needed a huge amount of computer power that hadn't been available up until recently. So many of these things you see where people talk about, look at this great thing we can do with deep learning. We can, but they may run for you know, thousands of hours of training in a big server farm on the cloud and things like that. So the, the power of computing met these new types of networks in a way that really allowed some breakthroughs to happen. And the, <clears throat> the biggest of these breakthroughs, the one that really caught the attention of the research community, the Go game sort of caught the public attention was that um, for a long time now, there was something called WordNet. It had lots and lots of words arranged into categories and groups of words. And what a group at Stanford did was they created something called ImageNet, which was for each of the terms in WordNet, they found a set of photos of those things. So this is a little hard to 
see there, this is kind of a clustering picture, but on one side are ducks, and on the other side are cats. And what happened is they created a set of images, right, years ago. So for years, there's been a computer vision challenge. What happened is the set of images was given to a lot of humans, and they said, you know, tell us what's in the picture, you know, sort of draw a box around it and say what's in it. And humans performed that at about 93% accuracy uh, across humans, right? So one person is, you know, almost everybody agrees this thing is a cat. At some point you get someone who says, I think that's a bird, and someone else who says, I'm not sure, you know, I think maybe that's a dog or something, if it's a little bit blurry, things like that. So it's hard, to, nothing can really get 100%, but these are... So, what, so what's used as your metric of performance is sort of how you do against this ground truth set of what humans said, and the consensus opinion of the bulk of humans is, is sort of considered to be true, right? And what happened was, um, I don't have the curve in this set, but, but over a very short period of time in the late uh, 2010s and beyond, the computer went from about doing 60 or 70 percent in the absolute best systems very quickly in about a three-year period until they were outperforming humans on these tests. So these are some examples of the kind of pictures. So you get a photo like this, and what you can see is in the first one we have sort of a bird that's eating a frog, and you've labeled one area bird and one area frog. I'll come, I'll, I'll, much later in the talk, I'll, I'll talk a lot about this one up in the corner with the person, the chair, and the dog. Uh, but you can see there's other things, motorcycles, helmets, people. So these are, are, you know, a lot of different concepts. Turns out the same techniques that were being used for vision also work for speech. So that's one of the reasons now um, so many of the speech recognition systems have become so much better. So I can, uh, you know, you can talk to your phone and say, Google, you know, what is this, or, um, you know, Alexa, Siri, all those things. So, so there were some really strong results came out of this over the past few years. Uh, the associative uh, learning is really a, a, a sort of text mining and question answering thing. And what had happened for a long time... The assumption was the best way to do question answering with a computer would be to really program a lot of deep knowledge into it, really make sure it knew a lot of facts and had rules for how to reason over those facts. So um, if I ask you, you know, is a duck a kind of bird, the answer, you, you can know that. And if I know birds typically fly, then I can say, OK, so would a duck fly? And you can say yes. And then you need to know exceptions. So, Penguins are birds, but they don't fly. And there's a whole mass of literature for many, many years of AI on that. And um, <clears throat> a lot of the big knowledge engineering efforts like psych and things like that were aimed at this domain. And what happened is um, a group at IBM started questioning whether that was the right way to do uh, question answering. In fact, the... Um, story that they don't tell a lot out in the outside world was what happened is they had this group who were doing that kind of question answering. And they hired a summer intern, a grad student, and said, we're going to play Jeopardy at the end of this uh, summer. So this was about three years before the televised game. And this was a project where they were actually trying to decide were they going to set out to try to beat the Jeopardy game. And so one group had had funding from the U.S. government for many, many years and had the absolute state-of-the-art question answer in certain deep domains. And the other one was a kid who sort of basically grabbed stuff from Wikipedia and did sort of a best search and a couple quick heuristics and things like that. And he beat them significantly. So at that point, the group that had been doing this deep quest, this, this question answering said, you know, maybe we'd better look at this stuff too, right? We just sort of were... 30 top researchers were just beaten by one graduate student because he took advantage of the information that's so plentiful on the web. And what really was going on there was rather than trying to understand the question in any deep sense, it was using a variant on search. So you would kind of search, you would take the question, use it almost like a search query, 
get some proposed, you know, look at some of the documents that came up and just kind of look for what are the key words in those documents that best associate with the words in the uh, question. Now, it didn't do very well. It just did much better than the previous thing. So over the next few years, they put together a team to really go after this Jeopardy game. And in the end, in a two-game set, they uh, stunningly beat the two best people who've ever played the game on TV. Now, in America, I don't know how popular Jeopardy is in, in Canada, but in America, this is like the game show. We all grew up on it, right? Actually, the, uh, the host is Alex Trebek, who's a Canadian, but uh, used to be a different one. So like the first time I ever saw a, a Jeopardy game was, I, I think I was in second grade, and many of you can probably guess you weren't born yet when I was in second grade. So this game was around for many, many years. And what happened is the guy on the right there, uh, Ken Jennings, was, the, um, was to Jeopardy what Michael Jordan was to basketball, or pick your favorite, uh, you know, Bobby Orr to hockey, things like that. I mean, this was uh, Pelé to soccer. This was the guy. He was just so much better than anyone else. And he was only beaten once in a tournament play of this game, which was by this other guy, this side, guy named Brad, uh, uh, Ken Jennings, Brad Rudner. And um, Brad really wasn't better at answering the questions, but it turns out an aspect of Jeopardy is the question is asked, a light bulb goes on, and you push a button. And if you push the button before the light bulb goes on, you get locked out for a little while, right? And the first person to push the button after the light bulb goes on is the one who gets to answer the question. I know it sounds like I'm getting into a lot of uh, detail, but some of this will come up again later. Um, so Brad was the world's best button pusher, <laughs> right? I mean, they said literally, when you were watching the game, when Brad was playing, so you can't see when you watch it on television, you don't see the light going on. But people in the studio said, Brad was so good at predicting when the question would end and when the light would go on, that he was usually pressing the button. You literally, so as soon as the first person presses, the light goes off. They said, you wouldn't even see the light go on. It's like he would literally be pressing right as it happens. So that meant he got to answer the questions first. So if you're pretty good and answer the questions first, you can beat someone who's very good who doesn't get to the questions. And actually, so Watson had to, they actually had to build a computer, a, a robot button pusher, right? So when the light went on, right, Watson would be allowed to push just like the, the humans would. Um, it didn't hear the question, it was shown the question, and that's fair because the human, the question is exposed in text, and the human can read the text right at that moment, regardless of how long it takes the host to read the question. So there were a lot of things in here that are very subtle. But one of the things that's very interesting is Watson would show sort of its top few choices and what its certainty factors were. And so you could actually analyze this game very clearly. And in a two-game series, the computer very, very handily beat these two people. Now, interestingly, um, by the second game, the second day, Brad had more or less given up. He was just playing like normal. Ken had changed his strategy to try to beat the computer. He decided rather than trying to think of the answer and then ring in, he would ring in every single question that he could. So he was consistently trying to always be the first. And, and then he would try to do it. So, so he talks. There's some things he's written since then. So again, we saw some very big differences between kind of how the computer and the human did this. And I've given some talks. In fact, I think I gave one up here a couple years ago on Watson as a cognitive mechanism. And what you see is mostly it's not, but there's a few things where it does. And what's interesting is some of those things where it did have now become part of how a lot of the modern AI and language technology is being done by IBM and their systems. Okay. The third one is, the, um, is stuff that came out of a project called the Semantic Web that was launched 20-something years ago. And it was really to take to sort of organize that associative network, that, that associative information into graphs and networks of um, either unlabeled and then later labeled graphs, and then use some of the AI inferencing techniques on top of those. 
And this became very big in <coughs> both search and social networking applications. So this is um, basically now, the term knowledge graph was uh, coined by uh, Google in about 2012 as a marketing term. And now many people, because of Google's ability to claim that they invented something, attribute this all back to Google. But um, it really was this idea to take these labeled graphs and use them for various kind of things on the web. So advertising matching uh, and friend peering and those kind of things in social networks. Uh, you've seen this application if you've used any of the modern search engines. So when you get that box on the side, so if you type a question now to Google, it'll actually sometimes give you an answer. If you type a, an entity that it recognizes, you'll often get this box on the side. That box is being generated by the knowledge graph. So it says, I think you're talking about this thing. So there's lots of people in the world named Tom Hanks, but if you time, type Tom Hanks to Google, we'll assume you want to talk about, uh, you know, the, uh, Tom Cruise, sorry. Uh, you want to talk about this particular, you know, famous person, right? And in fact, it also does some personalization and learning we won't go into until a little bit later. But so all this stuff on the side is being generated by that knowledge graph, but that graph <coughs> is allowing some very powerful graph techniques with some very simple inferencing techniques to help the system figure out how things are related to each other. So if you name a actor, you'll get in there what are some of the films they've been involved in, uh, some of the facts of their life mostly. A lot of this gets mined from Wikipedia, but from other things too. If you type in academic, you would typically see uh, either the books they've published or might show you some of the other. And then sometimes when it doesn't have a category, it'll just say, here's people who search for this person also search for these other people. Um, now, <coughs> the, the extraction of this information comes a lot from what's on the web by a series of things. But one of the main ones is people actually put into the web page generator now some machine-readable metadata. So it actually says, this paragraph is talking about this movie or this person or this thing, and this is the name and this is that. And it's all arranged around something called schema.org that I'm not going to go into. But in um, 1999, when some of this first stuff started, um, the language of the semantic web, some people from Google said, you know, it's on such a small number of pages, we're never going to see it in the crawl. By uh, 2015, uh, Guha, one of Google's head researchers back then, he since left the company, said it was on 30% of the crawl. And actually at our, uh, the World Wide Web Conference, which was held here in 2016, Peter Norvig, the research director of Google, said 50%. So that means half of the pages that they're crawling on the web have this embedded metadata, which has two real advantages. One is, of course, Humans have marked that up, so that gives them the knowledge. But also, you can then feed that to the learning algorithms as training data. So say, hey, here's a page we know exactly how it's describing a product. Now we can take other pages that are describing products, do the same. So when you start combining these three techniques, uh, you can really get some power. By the way, it's not just Google, that's Baidu, that's Bing. They all do a lot of the same things. So, so to summarize this kind of first part of the talk, why we're really so excited about AI these days has been this incredible learning we see from deep learning, which takes a lot of data, but is able to learn uh, various things with very high quality compared to what was doable a few years ago. This associative learning, again, taking a lot of the information on the web or on other data sources and finding kind of creating networks out of that and how that works together, and then the labeling and linking and, and algorithms tied to that of the semantic web and knowledge graphs. So, so that's kind of where a lot of the excitement comes from. And normally what would happen at this point if I was a traditional researcher in sort of modern AI, I would now go through all sorts of ways in which this is so powerful and solves everybody in the room's problems, right? Instead, I'm going to go a slightly different direction, right? What happens when we actually look at 
how these things are typically evaluated versus how they perform when you get into a larger world. And then what are some of the reasons for that? So a very large area of, of research now is called visual question answering. And the idea is, well, I showed you we have these nice language technologies and this great vision technology. Why not put them together, right? So there's a test set. So it's a bunch of images and a bunch of questions about those images and then a bunch of answers. And in the traditional neural network style, people train on some of them and test on others. And you get things like this. So what is the person holding? And it says, you know, I think very highly that, you know, highest um, rated answer is that it's a cell phone. And the second one is scissors. And the thir third one is a bat for whatever reason. And, you know, you can run a lot of these. And then these things are tested. And, you know, if you build an algorithm that does better than the last person's, you get to publish at NIPS and uh, AAAI and all the big conferences. And then the next person comes along and tries to make it a little better. And there's all sorts of techniques in here. I'll talk about some of them later. But, but here's the problem. They're almost never tested like this, right? What is this person holding, right? And the system has said, uh, ski poles, a surfboard, or a bat, right? Now, now, I hear some giggling, and that's, the I hope, the correct response. Because what you'd really like the system to say is, what a stupid question. Nobody's holding anything, right? But you don't get that kind of answer from these systems, right? They're finding the best fit to what they know, right? So among other things, they don't know the bounds of their language. They don't know what they do and don't know. It reminds me of the classic frame problem. It, it's very related to the classic frame problem, and I'm going to go there soon, but I'm not going to use that frame, framework for it. So, so that was you know, looking sort of at the visual side. Here's, here's another example. So. Um, this was one of the slides that Norvig uh, presented at this conference, and he was talking about how do we take what we're learning from the markup pages and what we find on the other pages and you know, put them together, get them correct. That you know, we, we use the fact base to seed it, we use a lot of natural language technology, probabilistic inference, active learning, and then he sort of hand-waved away this one called human judgment, he said, and there's people in the loop, right? Um, the reason there's people in the loop is because some of this stuff doesn't work well um, <clears throat> in terms of the way we think, right? So just to give you an example, this is from uh, a paper published by Peter Mika at, um, uh, of, uh, he was Yahoo search at the time. So Google doesn't like to show you the things they got wrong. Peter liked to give talks about what were the challenges that they needed researchers to help them. Well, and this is one of my favorite examples. So in generating that side box for the term Michelangelo, right, it has the correct information that Michelangelo was a painter and when he lived and all that sort of stuff. But then that's the picture it's chosen to show us who Michelangelo is. Now, I think most of you realize that's not a very good picture of a Renaissance human painter, right, which is what the description says Michelangelo is. What's happened there is those of you who know the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles know that the four turtles were each named after a famous Renaissance painter, Michelangelo, Leonardo, Donatello, and Raphael. So associatively, those four Renaissance artist names show up together quite often, right? And have lots and lots and lots of pictures on the web that are associated with them. Right? By the way, it's very, very hard to find a photograph of the original Michelangelo for some reason. <laughs> right? so, so from the computer's point of view, and using all the kinds of technologies I've been talking about, this is actually a pretty good answer. Right? Problem is it's just wrong by our knowledge. Right? So what is it that we do in here that somehow is different than that? And that's really what a lot of us grapple with when we look at how sort of these modern AI the sort of cognitive stuff, and then sort of some of the older AI may all be coming together. Now, don't read this slide. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of words on it. But in 1993, a, a paper, a very seminal paper, was written about knowledge representation by three MIT professors, Randy Davis, Howie Shrove, and Pete Slovitz, where they described 
why you needed what we now call good old-fashioned AI or symbolic AI, why a knowledge representation was important, why just having a lot of numbers in a learning system wasn't good enough. And I'm really only going to talk about two of them today, but we could go through the others too. But they're basically two really important ones. Um, the first one is that the knowledge representation is most fundamentally, and there's a lot of words here, but a surrogate, a substitute, right? It's used to be able to, to manipulate something, and Stephen talked about symbol grounding. These are the manipulation of those symbols. I have no idea what you said about symbol grounding. But um, the idea is that if you take a lot of these current neural networks, right? So, so if I said to people here in the room, um, Supposing this morning when you wanted to come here, right, uh, I don't know how most of you got here. Let's assume you all took the metro. I said, there was a metro strike. What would you do, right? So most of you would say, oh, I would drive or I would take a cab or I would Uber or I would walk or whatever. But none of you have to go home, right, call up a lot of people to come make a metro strike, right, so that you can decide what you can do you are able to somehow manipulate a mental model of the world in some sense, rather than needing the actual world, right? I can't take these current neural networks and say, imagine you had a photo of a dog, right? Now think that it's sitting next to a child. I actually need to have the photo there for it to do that labeling and things like that. So it's not necessarily picking up the concepts, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. The second thing is, uh, Language is something we as humans use a lot to communicate. So one of the things a lot of people who are doing this computer work forget is that it doesn't kind of matter so much what the internal representation of the computer is. If it's trying to interact with a human, it better somehow be able to map over to the human concepts. So the associative learning is kind of building this mathematical network between things, this Deep learning is building a different kind. They don't really correspond, but even when they do, they're organizing the way, the, w the world, the way it makes most sense to the computer, not necessarily the way it would make sense to a human trying this. So I was um, on a panel once at the uh, US Library of Congress, and we were having this discussion. Someone said, well, just imagine you took all these books and just took all the words and all the pages, and you threw it into a computer, and you let it organize everything by clustering and supervised learning and semi-supervised learning. And you know, I went through this whole spiel and said, you know, we wouldn't need the Dewey Decimal System. We wouldn't need librarians. The system would just organize stuff. And I just said, yeah, you know, that's true. But how would we find any of it? Right? It'd be like using a search engine. You would type a few words, and it would say, I think these are the books you want. And that's not really how we want to use something that's organized. We want that organizational structure to be useful with respect to our human cognition. So, so just to give you a couple of examples. Yeah, you knew this one was coming. Um, so I talked about cats and ducks before. Um, I love this example because my, my daughter's first two words were cat and duck, right? And for, for a period of her life, from about, I guess, about 10 months to, 12, to about 14 months, the whole world was cats and ducks. And it was fascinating because some things actually made sense. So, so the first time she saw an airplane flying by, she looked up and she said, duck! And we were like, oh, look, she's got the concept of wings and flight and stuff like that. But then she might look at Stephen and go, cat! And look at this guy and go, duck! Right? And we have no clue why some people were cats and some people were ducks. And you know, some of her favorite toys, the duck toy was duck and our pet cat was cat. But you know, like a little bear might be a cat or a duck or whatever. And sometimes it would change. Now, my, my child is now um, a little older than that. But, um, but here's the thing. Now assume you took your kid or a human and a dog, and by dog I mean deep learning system, and you train them to recognize cats and ducks based on some kind of uh, inputs, right? Uh, in the real world, your dog will significantly outperform a person at being able to differentiate cats from ducks. In fact, there's one of those behind that bush. 
your dog, because of its sensory apparatus, will be able to say, that's a cat, where the person will say, I don't know, I can't see it. Right? But even if I showed you sort of a, a blurry world, right, the dog can't necessarily do it uh, visually. But again, we, we can imagine the dog learning to do that. But now consider the following. right? So, so I called my, my kid when I was writing this book, and I said, uh, how would you explain the difference between a duck and a cat? to a child. And their first answer was, oh, you're not going to tell that story again, Daddy, are you? Uh, my daughter's 31 years old, doing her PhD in linguistic anthropology, so she knows a lot more words now than cat and duck in a lot of languages. But I said, please, humor me. So the answer they came up with was, if I was telling it to a kid, I'd probably say something like, the cat has fur and four legs and goes meow. The duck is a bird, and it swims and goes quack, right? So, so that, at the moment, is what these deep learning systems are not doing. You can give it language in to get language out. You can give it pictures in to get labeled pictures out. But it, it's not somehow creating internal structures that map between these things. And those internal structures don't seem to have the kind of organizational principles that uh, have been studied for many years when we look at humans and cognitive science, category theory, many other things. Um, I don't know what the second talk went to, but it looked like some of this was being referred to. So, so here's another example, right? This is, the, this is what we call the background knowledge channel. So if I show this picture and just say, what is the relationship between this man and this woman? Actually, it turns out I've now done this with a lot of different audiences, and it actually varies a lot by age, and mm -hmm. but pretty much everyone says, OK, it seems to be a younger man dancing with a slightly older woman, uh, something like that, right? And in fact, one of my students who's just finished his PhD, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of his other work later, which is trying to put some of these together, had a neural network solution, deep learning, uh, adversarial network with some post-processing, and it took a CNN, and was able to actually generate. So there's been a lot of work of just generating this single component. So uh, there's, a, uh, there's a woman wearing a dress. There's a dress which is blue. There's a man next to the woman. There's a woman, you know, there's a man uh, wearing a shirt. There's a shirt that is white. So, so this was, the, this was work Concene Graphs tries to put those together. So again, if I, have a, if I tell you that a picture has a man and a blue shirt and a man and a green shirt, right? is that one man with a blue shirt and a green a shirt that's both blue and green, or is that two men, one who's got a blue shirt and one who's got a green shirt, or whatever? So these try to solve that problem. So that was the particular technical issue being done. But as we started looking more and more at these problems, and I'll show you some real world examples later, you get, you get an effect that looks something like this, right? Now if I ask you, what can you tell me about the man and the woman? And if you've grown up in sort of our, um, you know, sort of the, Eastern, uh, the, the Western world culture of uh, um, weddings and things, then what you'd say is, you know, look at that woman in the long white dress in the back. This must be a wedding. And a wedding has a reception. And one of the things that happens at the reception is the groom dances with uh, the groom's mother. So a lot of people seeing that will actually say, I think that's the groom dancing with his mother. Now, we can actually permute that by telling you other kinds of information. right? So, so one of the answers a learning person might say, well, just give me enough pictures and label some of them as weddings and some of them as other things, some of that, and I'll learn that. But the question is, each time you want to kind of double that, you need a lot more data, right? So supposing I tell you this particular groom is an orphan, okay? Well, now you would go back and say, well, that can't be his mother. Maybe it's a different relative. So maybe he's dancing with an aunt, or, or maybe it's the bride's mother or something. Or maybe that's not the groom. It's just someone else at a wedding dancing. So you change your answers as you learn more knowledge. Again, we don't yet have a way to do that with these kind of systems we've been talking about. So somehow that background knowledge changes what you believe. Here's a, a, a more real world example of this. So um, 
one of the things that these systems are being deployed for nowadays is uh, radiology, so looking at x-rays and saying, where is the tumor, what's going on? However, again, most of those systems are being tested in a, in a known environment. So you say, a, a, a biopsy has revealed this person has a cancer here, where is it? Right? That's a little different than saying, look at this picture and tell me, is there a cancer? And if so, where is it? Right? So as you get broader, and this is well known from the 80s in medical systems and things like that, you get a lot of confusions. Again, you get the same problem that happens in things. So in the picture um, on my right, your left, um, that little thing where the little white arrow is pointing at a, at a lump, that looks very much like a tumor. Okay. Um, in this particular case, this is the x-ray of a woman who has had a mastectomy, so it cannot be a breast tumor, right? It's just literally impossible. That's sort of like the groom is an orphan. Now, a really trained expert looking at this thing may say, you know, I actually see something that could be a tumor here, but I see other things in this picture that kind of represent to me, and I don't know what they are. Um, in the way that these things are related to each other, something that would tell me it's probably not, and maybe even, the, and, and the real experts would say, you know, I can see some evidence that this person has had that operation, right? Or similarly on the other side, the one labeled B here, that green thing is pointing at an actual tumor that's very, very hard to detect. Unless you know the relationship between various parts of things, so something is behind something and above something and not in something else, which you can deduce from some of the, the uh, things that would be in that kind of graph I showed you. So, so what you're doing here is you're sort of saying, I need to bring in some other kind of knowledge beyond just what's in the picture to answer these questions correctly, right? And these get harder and harder as you add, you know, this is an x-ray of an entire body, what's going on here, things like that. Um, we have a major research project going on in one of the programs at my school where we're actually, where we look at these things and are trying to do the imaging. A lot of what we're training on now is you have a lot of images coupled with what the doctor said. So, so there's, a real, there's a real need for these things. In, um, in a lot of parts of the world, the difference between survival rates for cancers is, is, um, is stunning between the developed and the, unde and the developing worlds. So um, breast cancer has been studied extensively in these things. And so one of the problems is you don't have the people who can read these early pictures and say, this is someone who needs to go be tested, and this is someone who doesn't. So, so um, they want to train on that. So we have a lot of examples where um, we've seen that, right? Where, I'm, I'm sorry, where, so this is what the picture was, this is what the doctor said. And the question is, can we do this thing about putting the images and the, um, the words together. Um, I'm not going to go through this in any detail, but the other thing is you want to be able from these things, one of, one of the problems you have in these, these deep learning systems is how do you see the things that are not directly per perceivable? So there's a picture of uh, a piece of, a pizza, of, of some pizza Right? And if I ask you, is this a vegetarian pizza or not? Right? That's actually an inference process. You have to say, what are the ingredients that I see on the pizza, and are they made out of meat or not? Right? Assuming, you're not assuming you're in a category that allows cheese to be on a vegetarian pizza, that gets into another whole set of deeper issues about representation. So here was a training system where actually the system learned what techniques were eat best learned directly, which things were easily inferable, and which things to leave for later inference. And again, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but it, it, um, there was a recent doctoral thesis from one of my students that really showed that when you can bring these kind of logical entailments from traditional knowledge in, some good things happen. So um, let's look at... Uh, that picture I showed you before, and think about it from the point of view of some, uh, some nice questions we can ask. All of these systems, let's assume we can put together the associative knowledge, the network knowledge, and this imaging. 
So if I show you this and say, which could you sit in, right? Pretty much all of these techniques will get it right, right? You'll get a little bit of confusion from the language associative stuff between sit and dog, right? But sit in will typically get you to the chair, OK? Uh, not too bad, OK? Uh, which one can bite which other one, right? Um, I actually ran this through a set of students recently, and, and a couple came up with some answers that I hadn't thought of before. But typically, people will say, the dog can bite the kid, the kid could bite the dog, right? If people think about it a little longer, then they'll say, oh, actually, the kid could bite the chair, and the dog could bite the chair. No one yet has said the chair could bite the dog, or the chair could bite the kid, unless they were talking metaphorically, right? But if I say, you know, why, right? In a sense, the, these current AI systems say, well, because I've never seen anywhere in my training data where a, where a chair bit anyone, right? But if I said to you, can this bite the baby? Can this bite the baby? Can this bite the baby? Right? You'll answer all those questions correctly based on, we believe, a generalization that's something like inanimate things don't bite things, right? The other interesting thing was a couple of the students said, well, you know, the baby could bite itself or the dog could bite itself, which I had never thought of. And that's a reflexive thing that, you know, is, uh, is, a you know, is another kind of inferencing. So what we're seeing is, even though you can get these questions right, answering them right doesn't necessarily mean, in a sense, understanding. And I'm not going to try to define that term, right? Here, here's, here's another one. Which one is most likely to become a computer scientists someday. Again, all of these techniques would say the person, right? Because, you know, basically, again, whether you just have never seen a computer scientist that wasn't a human or you know humans or computer scientists. If I said, how would they go about doing it? Most of the current techniques can't... So, <clears throat> so the, quote, planning or recurrence of these deep learning systems that are projecting out into the future is typically a very short time period, right? Not years, right? So this is a baby. It's going to take a long time. And saying, uh, you know, and, and again, the, some of these systems will get that answer. If somewhere on the web they say, find a document called How to Make Your Child Grow Up to Be a Computer Scientist, but that's not really solving the problem. And again, I'm, I'm just using this as one of many examples of planning, of looking forward a long period of time. Okay, which one would you save if the house is on fire? This is really, to me, the big question, right? And again, when you, when you ask real people, what you usually get is people who more or less end up with, I feel bad about the dog, but I save the child, right? And, and we hope that that's the answer, right? We would like that to be the answer, right? Sometimes I give this talk and someone comes up to me afterwards and says, you know, what if it's a really valuable chair? I said, <laughs> my answer is, you know, you're not being hired as a babysitter in my house, right? In fact, that's the real question. Would you hire a robot babysitter if all you have is training data that, you know, you have the, the, the person who's selling it to you says, you know, in 99.87% of all the tests we've ever given it, it, it saved the baby. Or, you know, we've never really tried it on an actual fire, but in our simulator, it usually saves the baby, or even always saves the baby, right? You, you really want there to be a rule in there. You really want to know what it's going to do. In fact, if you um, <clears throat> ever watched the movie I, Robot, uh, which was kind of a terrible movie in its own way, but the, um, the thing that caused one of the humans to be so upset was... A, uh, a robot policeman saves him when a car is, um, uh, you know, the, the car has fallen off a bridge, the uh, person is saving him, and is not saving a child in the other car. And when asked, basically the answer is, the probability of saving you was much higher than the probability of saving the other one. And we as humans really get why he's upset. We understand that you know, there's a time where you would sacrifice yourself for someone else in these kind of situations, right? There, there was, and, you know, this was being used as, this was long ago, you know, an example of human emotion versus robots without emotions. So, um, 
so a lot of what seems to be going on here, and this is if I went into a technical talk, so I'm just going to do one slide here and really do it, is it seems like our AI systems are still learning best in well-defined contexts or trained situations where they have a pretty complete set of knowledge against that world, right? But humans are also good at sort of that gray area when things go outside or where there's other information that would cause your basic answer uh, to change, right? So, yeah, that's a man dancing with a woman. Oh, the bride, that's the groom. Um, I'm going to skip some of this. But right now, when we look at, at what's in these computers, sort of summarizing a lot of what I've said, is what did we have in the old-fashioned AI that we're not really seeing so much yet in these new technologies? So long-term planning, built-in rules. By the way, there's been a couple recent papers where rules are being introduced sort of within the learning network of, of deep learning, and that's quite an interesting piece of work. And, and again, human interaction, and somehow this, this background knowledge, which is often coming in through other information. Um, there's some evidence that when you combine humans and computers right now, they can outperform either one alone. I'm not going to go through these because I'm running out of time. But um, there was actually one study, for example, where doctors with a diagnostic computer. So you had uh, several conditions. One was a doctor alone. Second one was the diagnostic computer alone. Third one was two doctors to control for maybe it's just two brains is better than one. And the doctor and the computer. And the doctor with the computer significantly outperformed all three of the others. And that's not really surprising. The computer was good at certain kinds of reasoning. And the doctor was good at other kinds. And when you put them together, important. And, that really gets me to sort of the, the crux of this stuff. Why this is important, and this is... Uh, st yeah, good. That's about what I was expecting. <laughs> uh, the, um, this, is, this is a story some of you may have heard about a man named Stanislav Petrov. He passed away a couple years ago. Um, if it wasn't for this guy, none of us would be here today. Okay, Stanislav Petrov was the... Um, the lieutenant in a nuclear bunker in Russia, monitoring a set of lights that indicated that the US had launched missiles. And his job was when the lights came on, he was supposed to pick up the phone, call the Kremlin and say, the US is attacking us, launch a nuclear strike back. Right? Um, and Petrov is sitting there and a few lights went on. It actually turns out later to be five. Okay? And Petrov said, um, and there's a quote here, but essentially what he said is, I had been trained many, many times on many, many scenarios, and this one just didn't look right to me. Right? So he said, I went back to reasoning. I sort of said, how in the world would, would, would the US attack Russia with only five missiles? Right? They know that that wouldn't do significant enough damage, and they know they would be wiped out in return. So a, a, a really large number of missiles makes sense. Five doesn't. And so he didn't make the phone call. And, and you know, the story, there's a whole book on, the, on him and his life. He says, you know, the, it's about 20 minutes at that time for the missiles to get from the U.S. to Russia. He said they were the scariest 20 minutes of his life, because he may have just doomed his country. Right? But he said, you know, everything... I knew told me that this couldn't be an attack. And that's, that's the difference to me between this kind of human cognitive side of things and, and this AI training thing. The AI thing just at the moment doesn't have a way to say that doesn't look like something I've seen before. There's no woman in that picture of the airplane. This question doesn't make any sense, right? Now, again, there's many ways we could look at this, training on different kinds of data, extending what we give to things, et cetera. But right now, it seems like the best way to solve this problem is having humans and computers working together, right? Where we can take advantage of that cognitive symbolic stuff we have as humans and take advantage of that strong mathematical learning stuff that we see in the computers. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you.
Yep, terrific. Uh, we'll have stuff this afternoon, so I won't use my prerogative. Les questions. Uh, questions. You can ask a question. Vous pouvez poser la question en français, je traduirai. Just go to the micro, my microphone. For the last, uh, last example that you gave here, do you think that uh, if we, uh, uh, that uh, because you didn't def define really what makes the difference, there is a difference between human and computer, but can we uh, simplify that in saying that if we take a computer, uh, it's inference in his case, in human case, it's inference, and this inference comes from his le learning all over his, uh, his years. So if we take the, a computer and let him learn at the same age like uh, your daughter and then keep learning, keep learning, it will arrive to the same situation right. as the... So, um... So when we look at those kind of questions, so I'm asked that question a lot. What if we just let it learn enough? What if we had enough data? What if we, there's still a pretty good evidence that these systems are not human le learning like humans. So again, we're at a meeting on cognitive meets computer, right? You can get exceptional performance out of these things. And I'm, I'm, I'll save a little bit of this discussion for the debate tonight, because this is some, one of the questions we're going to grapple with. But, um, I used to give this talk, I had a, uh, so when we did the conference in, uh, at the convention center here, I actually had a stuffed moose with, a moose puppet with me. And two of the speakers, Tim Berners-Lee and Peter Norvig, borrowed the moose so it could give the talk. So a few months later, when I gave more or less the, uh, the first version I ever gave of this talk, I had the moose with me. And I said at the very beginning of, of the talk, you know, the reason I have the moose is he's very famous. He's given talks with Tim Berners-Lee and Peter Norvig, right? And then I went into my talk, and then at the very end I had, by the way, why did I have the moose with me? And I had a multiple choice test, right? And I had words that associated with moose, and I had words that associated with people. And one of the answers is, you know, the one I gave. And, you know, everyone kind of got the point that they had learned in one shot. They hadn't seen millions of times where mooses were giving talks and not giving talks. So, so it's pretty clear that our learning includes some things very different than this kind of learning just from a lot of data, right? Because, because at least once we've developed the symbolic structures, we seem able to learn from very small numbers of examples. Now, a lot of people are grappling with these. There's a lot of other kind of learnings I didn't talk about today, reinforcement learning, associative learning, active learning. But again, none of these yet are really coming up with answers to this sort of general question of why things happen. Steve and I were talking about this before. Um, I speak a little bit of Spanish, no French, a little bit of Hebrew, right? When I'm in a Spanish-speaking country, the Hebrew words go away and I speak Spanish okay. And when I'm in a Hebrew-speaking country, the, he the Spanish words go away and I speak Hebrew okay. When I'm sitting here now, if I tried to generate a sentence in Spanish, I would actually have a lot of trouble trying to remember which were Spanish words and which were Hebrew words. And I'm not very good at either language, right? But somehow that contextual stuff going on around me is activating the right thing or is doing the right thing. Now, there's a lot, you know, in a certain deep sense, I believe that someday, if we can really understand bio-inspired mechanisms and brain-like things and what's going on, maybe we could have a computer that learns like we do, because I have a sort of existence proof that this stuff can do that, right? But we're a long way from it with the technologies we have today, and that's what I'm trying to say. So, so taking the current technologies and just letting them go for 20 years, you're not going to get the knowledge of a 20-year-old, right? So we need to study these things. Now, I have another version of this talk, by the way, that I give to traditional AI audiences, where I show them why ignoring the modern AI is the wrong thing. Right? Many of the assumptions we've been making for many years in good old-fashioned AI are wrong compared to what we're now getting from what's coming from these. Right? So, so again, there's, there's a lot of space in the middle to be explored. And that's really all I was trying to get it today, but I came sort of from this end because I think more of the people in the manufacturing community and the cognitive community these days are hearing about deep learning. Certainly in Montreal, you hear about it quite a lot. Uh, there's this other university over there that's well known. 